AMD made a lot of claims with its RX 5700 series of GPUs, like saying that the new blower cooler is, quote, quiet. Where AMD launched with tremendous power in the CPU category, especially the R5 3600 that we reviewed earlier today and we recommend, the company has had a much more difficult time pulling together a competitive GPU. Today we're benchmarking the RX 5700 XT for thermals, noise normalized thermals, acoustics, power consumption, and gaming versus relevant NVIDIA competition like the freshly released Super Series. Before that, this video is brought to you by Thermaltake C360 DDC Hard Tubing Water Cooling Kit. If you're ready to dip your toes into the water and build your first open loop cooling system, the Thermaltake C360 DDC hard tubing kit comes with all of the components you need. The kit includes a 360 millimeter radiator, three 120 ARGB fans, a copper W4 ARGB water block for the CPU, a pump and res DDC combo, and all the fittings needed to build a full CPU open loop. Learn more at the link in the description below. We have a lot of thoughts on Navi that we need to get through. Most of them will be in the conclusion. We're going to get into the benchmarks pretty quickly today. But the primer here, if you missed the architecture discussion, we have a separate video with David Cantor talking about the architectural changes in Navi. RDNA is actually a genuinely new backbone versus GCN, so this isn't some respin. It has meaningful updates to it, so Navi is a new GPU to look at. And separately, we do need to address some decisions that AMD made with Navi that will probably confuse some people. Uh, the most important of them is boost clock. So what everybody on Earth understands as boost clock, uh, especially people at AMD because they've used it this way before, is that boost is basically it's, it's your expected clock in a reasonable workload like gaming. And then you have base clock, which is the expected floor. And that's sort of it. That's what you get for numbers. There's a higher clock. That would be the peak clock. Uh, but what AMD has done is rebranded their clocks, because if you don't like the numbers, you invent new ones. And the boost clock is now a uh, basically a peak opportunistic clock, is I believe the phrasing that AMD is using. So this is something that could be hit, hit for milliseconds at a time, uh, for example. So, when you see the calculations on the spec sheets that have, for example, the amount of teraflops one can expect, be careful to distinguish between the one at the peak clock, which is not realistic, and the one at a reasonable clock, like the gaming clock. So anyway, that's all that means. Game clock in AMD's phrasing means basically the same thing as NVIDIA's boost clock. Peak clock you should ignore. And base clock, you should treat the same way you treat NVIDIA's base clock. Those two are mostly identical. So that's the marketing side explained. There are some other changes as well, like to overclocking. The 5700 non-XT can't overclock past a certain frequency. It is artificially locked. And that is done for product segmentation purposes, so that AMD can sell more of the high-end cards. And you don't just go out and buy the low-end card and then overclock it, which is odd, because the CPU division works completely the inverse to that. You can buy whatever CPU you want and overclock it, and it can be pretty damn good at the end of the day. So those are primary differences. There are others too. There were a lot of driver issues. AMD pushed a second driver version to press prior to launch. We did end up using that and the other one. And this is now becoming a trend with AMD launches. So we'll talk about that more in the conclusion. Let's get into the testing. We're going to start with thermals and frequency plots. We'll go through games, get through some power and noise figures, and then talk about the card on the whole. Just to establish what sort of frequency to expect with Navi, we'll start with the frequency over time plot in a fixed 3D Mark workload, and then move on to game testing. The RX 5700 XT doesn't have the same frequency falloff curve as Nvidia, where Turing boost behavior is extremely thermal dependent, but it does still have some thermal dependencies. The RX 5700 XT averages in the range of 1777 MHz to 1890 MHz, with a lot of small fluctuations along the way. You'll notice a few upward spikes and negative spikes in this plot. We considered deleting these data points as they're inaccurate, so I, it's not an accurate representation of reality, so they shouldn't really be shown, but we decided to leave them to illustrate an important point, which is that the drivers will still occasionally misreport the frequency, so the alleged spike to 2250 megahertz and the dip to 700 megahertz, both of these are fake. Performance during this benchmark, this fixed workload, did not reflect those changes. AMD spent a lot of time talking about how its new cooler is quiet this time, and so we'll look at that before we get into the gaming results. Here's an overtime thermal chart in our torture workload. Like with Radeon 7, Navi has two GPU temperatures to know about. There's the GPU temperature as normally presented. It's an edge temperature from the edge of the die that offers a lower number, 
And then there's the GPU junction temperature, which is the single hottest temperature. Basing clock boosts off of junction temperature allows for higher maximum clocks, as the card doesn't have to run conservatively against an edge temperature. TJ Maxx is 110 degrees uh, before it starts throttling with the non-overclocked lower power policy. With the cooler left fully stock and with no overclocks applied, we're climbing up to 95 degrees Celsius toward the end of the test and still slowly climbing. And this is with the uh, drivers freshly installed, so no weird driver bugs with thermal policy issues here at all. Actually, this was with the newer drivers too. The memory temperature measured at about 84 degrees toward the end of the test, which is approaching the 95 degree temperature range of GDDR6 where we stopped being comfortable. NVIDIA, to be fair, also has issues with memory thermals shown in our super reviews. Either card in a standard case with a case ambient of about 30 degrees, which is easily doable in a 20 degree room, would be running hotter than we're comfortable with for memory temperature. On the other hand, VRM thermals look pretty good. The hotspot VRMs plot in the range of 65 to 74 degrees Celsius, which is completely acceptable and well under the recommended range for MOSFETs. For the record, auto fan speed sat at around 2100 RPM during this test, which would put you in the range of about 52 dBA at a 20 inch measurement. That's very loud and doesn't at all match AMD's marketing of it being quiet. It's not, it's, it's the opposite of that. So we'll have noise levels after the gaming later. The next test will fix the fan speed to 40 dBA in our measurements, normalizing the fan RPM to look at how the thermals respond. This is a cooler efficiency test. So we're looking at the efficiency between a 2070 super cooler in a moment and the 5700 XT cooler, both at 40 dBA. The goal is to see if a user could lock this cooler down to a reasonable noise level, like 40 dBA. This is actually one of the worst stock coolers we've ever worked with. Following our standardized testing to normalize for 40 dBA, the GPU climbs to 110 degrees junction temperature, or about 100 degrees for edge temperature, which is still unacceptable, and begins to hit a thermal runaway scenario, only prevented because of frequency throttling on the core. We're dropping clocks here. This is in an open air bench with an ambient temperature of just 20 to 22 degrees Celsius. So it's only going to get worse in basically any case that's out. You can see our case reviews for more of that. Memory temperatures at 40 dBA are hitting about 97 degrees Celsius, which is uncomfortably warm for longevity, especially once you do put it in a case, and the MOSFETs end up in the 90s. We'll add the 2070 Super GPU thermals now, a competing card with a higher power consumption than the 2060 Super, and so it should be hotter. If anything, this would put things in AMD's favor because the 2060 Super and the 2070 Super use the same fans, but the 2070 Super is a higher power consumption part. Even still, it doesn't matter. The 2070 Super Founders Edition card plots at 67 degrees Celsius under full load for its GPU temperature, and that's at 40 dBA. Despite how much we complain about the screws and the super glue of the FE cards, we'll give Nvidia full credit for making something that doesn't blow. Quick note on overclocking before we get into the charts, you'll see a plus 50% power target offset in some of the benchmarks for games especially. And note that overclocking is presently mostly broken. It was very broken on the first press driver, and that's because the fan speed was not setting correctly. So we manually overrode that and set the, uh, a better fan speed, like 75%. And then with the updated press driver, we still had issues with overclocking. So we ended up, it was basically impossible to get it stable anywhere and we ended up just setting it to plus 50% power target. We got 25 to 50 megahertz out of the memory, and we couldn't get anything uh, manually out of the core because the software doesn't, it just, something's not working. So um, anyway, we set the power target and then we let the card boost, and it did gain about 100 megahertz by reporting, if we can trust that. So it still kind of overclocked itself, but we need to revisit overclocking separately once the drivers are fixed. So just wanted to note that so that when you see the OC results on the charts, hopefully those will improve once it's functional. Sniper Elite 4 is our first test. As always, we like to use this one for reliability, consistency, and well-optimized DirectX 12 implementation. Sniper Elite was actually originally one of AMD's best case scenarios in our testing back when NVIDIA was still on Pascal and just beginning to play around with asynchronous compute implementations in retail products. Unfortunately for the 5700 XT, today's landscape is different. The 5700 XT manages 71 FPS average in our Sniper Elite benchmark, which places it as 4.2% ahead of the RTX 2060 Super before an overclock is applied. With a trivial overclock on the 2060 Super, and ours was one of the worst overclockers you could ask for, it manages to tie the 5700 XT. Low end frame times are the same here. Now it's becoming clear why AMD dropped the price. This wasn't some 5D chess mental gymnastics, this was a requirement. 
and something that we confirmed speaking with people uh, inside of the companies that work with AMD and also uh, AMD. The RTX 2070 that AMD originally marketed the 5700 XT against is also tied with the XT, ranking again at 71 FPS average. On some retailers like Amazon with an MSI RTX 2070, the non-super 2070s are now available for about $450 to $460 as manufacturers try to clear out the stock. The RTX 2070 Super, now $100 over the 5700 XT after their price reduction, manages a lead of 11.7% over the 5700 XT when both are stock. Overclocking the 5700 XT resulted in an increase of about 6% over the 5700 XT stock. The clock averaged in the range of 1970 to 2017 megahertz as reported by the software with this plus 50% power target, but it's hard to tell since the frequency is misreporting through software anyway. It sometimes show, for instance, 65,000 megahertz, which would be and probably the best overclock ever in history, if it were accurate. Radeon 7 actually performs reasonably in this game, which isn't true in every scenario. The extra CU count seems to help in a significant way for this title. Strange Brigade is up next. This one is built by the same company as Sniper Elite 4, and it's built equally well, but instead gives us coverage of the Vulcan API. Additionally, we can use Strange Brigade to demonstrate the scaling delta from Vulcan to DirectX 12 with each GPU. We'll get to 1080p tests shortly, but starting with 1440p in the Vulcan API, and these RX 5700 XT runs at 122 FPS average with lows of 105 FPS for 1%, 104 for 0.1%. The 5700 XT ends up about 1.3% ahead of the non-A SKU RTX 2070 and roughly within our error margins. This marks the two as functionally identical. An A SKU 2070 would place higher here, approaching the 2070 overclock that we have on this chart, but it would still be between the 2070 Black and 2070 Black OC, which outperforms the 5700 XT. The RTX 2060 Super card is led by the 5700 XT by about 4%. Overclocking Super puts it beyond the 5700 XT stock and overclocked result, the latter of which is bugged as a result of poor launch drivers something for which AMD Radeon has become a repeat offender. In terms of price, the 2060 Super compares most directly to the 5700 XT, and that's before getting into things like noise, thermals, and power, something we'll do later. For gaming, they're within a few percentage points of each other in this benchmark. The RTX 2070 Super is on another level here, placing 12% ahead of in performance when stock, but after those price changes, it is also now another price category as well. Sometimes we see the performance stack change as resolution increases, potentially illustrating ROPs or memory limitations, things like that, bandwidth limitations. At 4K, the RX 5700 XT sits at 71 FPS average, ranking it as equal to an RTX 2060 Super card when it's overclocked. 1% lows are within error margins here. Performance over a non a SKU 2070, the lower bin one, uh, the one that launched at MSRP in October, that's why it's on the chart, because it was actually MSRP. It shows a performance lead of about 5.6% for the XT. Relative to 1440p, this is better performance when scaled against the old 2070. The new RTX 2070, now $100 more expensive, again, instead of 50, ends up at 77 FPS average and leads the 5700 XT by 8% when stock. Overclocking increases that lead to 18%. Overall at 4K, the 5700 XT recovers much of its losses from the 1440p results. This next chart looks at performance scaling between the two APIs available in Strange Brigade. The chart is ordered by best average FPS in Vulcan. A 100% number here, bar, would mean equivalence with Vulcan, whereas numbers below 100% indicate that performance is worse on DX12, and numbers over 100% indicate better performance on DX12, and this is all DX12 relative performance scaling versus Vulcan baseline. The RX 5700 XT performs about 1.5% better with DirectX 12, nearing error margins, and the overclock puts it 3% over Vulcan performance. AMD is doing better in DX12 than Vulcan for this title, although it's marginal in this instance. F1 2018 is next and gives us a look at an older, more standard DirectX 11 implementation. For this one, the RX 5700 XT runs at 150 FPS average with lows at 102 and 73. This positions the stock 5700 XT as about 9.9% ahead of the RTX 2070 non-A GPU. For everyone who felt buyer's remorse over their RTX 20 series purchases when Super came out this week, you're not alone. Now the AMD Radeon 7 buyers can feel the same remorse 
because an AMD card that's nearly $300 cheaper achieves the same performance in this game as the Radeon 7 did when it launched five months ago. If you're using Radeon 7 in professional applications and you can get use of that memory, you dodge some of this bullet by way of the extra VRAM having an actual use case for you, but it just doesn't really matter in these gaming workloads. More notably, as has always been the case with this game, AMD maintains significantly improved frame times over NVIDIA cards. This is something we've observed with every other recent AMD card in this specific title, although that flips a bit as you look at other games. This frame time plot will illustrate the peculiar behavior of the cards in this benchmark. 5700 XT holds steady at about 8 to 9 millisecond frame to frame intervals with almost no excursions from that average. We typically start seeing the excursions once they exceed 8 to 12 millisecond spikes. The 2070 bounces between 5 milliseconds at the low end and 16 milliseconds at the high end, marking the 5700 XT as a better experience in this title. 1440p for F1 2018 positions the RX 5700 XT at 115 FPS average, which is roughly tied with an overclocked 2070 Black and superior to the stock RTX 2070 Black. The RTX 2060 Super with an overclock reaches 110 FPS average, placing the 5700 XT stock GPU 4% ahead of the 2060 Super with an overclock. The RX 5700 XT with 50% more power roughly matches the stock Radeon 7, with the 2070 Super leading the stock RX 5700 XT by 7%. At 4K, the 5700 XT muscles ahead of the overclocked 2070 Black in F1 2018 and lands between the 2060 Super OC and 2070 Super stock performance. Overclocking doesn't do anything meaningful for us here, but we think that's primarily because the drivers are broken, although we don't expect much headroom here anyway because AMD has severely locked down overclocking to the point of it being a tremendous disappointment. Hitman 2 is up next, first with DirectX 12. At 1080p, Hitman 2 positions the RX 5700 XT about equal with an overclocked RTX 2060 Super, or about 3.8% ahead of the RTX 2060 Super when stock. The 2070 Super leads the 5700 XT by 9% in this title, versus the RTX 2070, the 5700 XT leads by about 4 to 5% in average FPS, and uh, that's 2070 Black Edition, to be clear. With DirectX 12 and Hitman, all devices have a hard time with 0.1% low values, but we'll note fairly that NVIDIA's RTX 2060 Super is substantially improved over the 5700 XT. This is the inverse scenario as with F1 2018. So NVIDIA is pulling ahead in this one specifically for player experience. At 1440p, the RX 5700 XT ends up within error margins of the AMD Radeon 7 GPU and tied an average FPS with the overclocked RTX 2060 Super. The 2060 Super stock GPU ends up at 76 FPS average to the 5700 XT's 81 FPS average, but the 2060 Super maintains better 0.1% lows on this benchmark and thus a better experience. Again, the inverse of the F1 2018 results. DirectX 11 gives everyone an improvement in 0.1% low performance, seen here at 1440p. The RX 5700 XT is now functionally tied with the RTX 2070 Black and RTX 2060 Founders Edition when overclocked. That's not Super, mind you, that's the 2060. The RTX 2060 Super leads marginally, roughly with an error, and the 2060 Super with an overclock leads the pack of $400 cards. At 4K, the 5700 XT runs a 43 FPS average, about tied with the 2070 Black, although the 2070 has significantly better lows. The RTX 2060 Super is also functionally tied with both of these cards, and this is back on DX12, mind you. Shadow of the Tomb Raider at 1080p is up next. For this one, the 5700 XT places just below the RTX 2070 Super, so it does well in this benchmark. Performance has it at 124 FPS average compared to the 126 FPS average of the 2070 Super. This also positions the RX 5700 XT ahead of the Radeon 7 card when stock, and about 15% ahead of the RTX 2070 Black card. 1440p places the 5700 XT marginally ahead of the overclocked 2070 Black card, and about 15% ahead of the RTX 2060 Super. The RTX 2070 Super maintains a lead of 5.3%. Radeon 7 owners can unfortunately, once again, join the RTX 2060 and 2070 owners in mourning in the corner. At 4K, and these RX 5700 XT and 2070 Super keep the same distance as before, with the 2070 Super about 6% ahead. Technically, the Super is gaining distance as resolution increases, but it's not too much each time. It is, it is notable, though. The 5700 XT outperforms the stock RTX 2070 Black and the 2060 Super by about 16%. This is the last game before we get into power, thermals, and noise, which are very important for this blower card. Far Cry 5 at 1080p positions the RTX 2060 Super, 2070 Black, and the 5700 XT all in good company. 5700 XT leads the 2060 Super by about 4.7%. 
although the 2060 Super maintains better frame pacing than the 5700 XT. This is an instance where it's measurable, but probably not perceptible. Overclocking the 2060 Super ties it with the presently impotent RX 5700 XT overclock, both of which reach upwards toward a stock RTX 2070 Super. 3D Mark Time Spy is last before getting to those power numbers. This is useful for looking at performance more individually of the GPU and memory. GT1 is a GPU intensive workload, whereas uh, that's core clock, whereas GT2 is more memory intensive. This chart is sorted by total combined score, not shown but measured in the thousands, as GT1 and GT2 each have a weight contributing to that. For Time Spy, we measured the 5700 XT at 60 FPS average GT1 across multiple test passes, which positions Navi ahead of the 2060 Super by 7% in GT1, but allows the supercard to lead in GT2 by 2.2%. Super has more efficient memory in GT2, which could come down to things like Delta color compression, but we need to dig into it more after release uh, in a separate content piece, potentially. 5700 XT ends up about where Radeon 7 is in this test, but the 2060 Super with a light overclock blasts it ahead in total score. GT1 ends up at 60.8 FPS, not far from the 5700 XT, but GT2 pulls far ahead. Note that every single tenth of a point in FPS is important in 3D Mark scoring. The 2070 Super leads in total score at 10,181 points, whereas the 5700 XT is 8,810 points, netting a 16% lead. Although we didn't show those numbers because they're too big and they blow out the scale, but that's all you need to know for those. Power consumption is next. Our new power consumption testing for GPUs measures at the 12 volt rails, although we took some 3.3 volt rail measurements for the new Super and Navi cards. This testing is done with a custom built interposer to measure PCIe slot draw, as well as the 12 volt PCIe cable power consumption down the power supply cables. These charts will list the TDP for AMD and NVIDIA parts, but note that NVIDIA defines its power consumption based upon the GPU, and AMD defines its power consumption based upon the total board power, which is everything on the board. We're looking at synthetics for the first test. The Power Virus Furmark puts AMD's RX 5700 XT at 217 watts with just the 12 volt cables and PCIe slot measured. We separately measured the 3.3 volt slot uh, power consumption not plotted here as pulling 0.9 amps uh, or about three watts extra. We're right at about the TDP figure, plus or minus some measurement error. The RTX 2060 Super pulls 164 watts, or about 175 uh, max, if you include measurement error and maybe a couple of watts down 3.3 volt. And overclocking the 2060 Super puts it at 209 watts. Power consumption is finally getting closer. It took AMD an entire node shrink to almost match NVIDIA's power consumption at the same performance level but they got there eventually. The RTX 2070 pulls 214 watts for reference, and amusingly, applying a 50% power offset to the RX 5700 XT actually does what it suggests and increases power consumption by about 54% from the 217 watt figure previously. With the overpower setting applied, we measure about 335 watts to average in the range of 1990 to 2017 megahertz, assuming Wattman and GPZ aren't totally inaccurate. It's not worth the three to four FPS that we gain on average to generate that much more heat, since the power into the PC does effectively just make it a space heater. Also considering what a 2080 Ti can get done for the same amount of power, this highlights that Navi has difficulty scaling performance with higher power consumption than the spec. It's just, it, unfortunately it's not linear. It doesn't work that way. F1 2018 at 1440p places the 5700 XT at 206 watts from 12 volt power, which is about 30 watts more than the RTX 2070 Supercard. As a reminder, in this game, the 2070 Super outperformed the RX 5700 XT by 7.2%, meaning that it operated at 15% less power while doing so. The RX 2060 Super runs at 164.4 watts in this workload, for reference, with an overclock pushing it to 200 watts for 4K resolution. The 5700 XT runs at 214 watts for 4K, with the overpowered 5700 XT at 281 watts for 4K. Back to noise levels. Despite AMD's marketing, the RX 5700 XT runs loud and relatively hot. 40 dBA seems to happen at about 1650 RPM or so at 20 inches away, and noise levels are made worse by some sort of resonant frequency issue within the cooler. Maybe turbulent air making noise inside of the shroud, or maybe a bearing for the fan. The noise levels for the card end up looking like this. The curve plots above everything else here for the 5700 XT, with all the others being dual fan coolers or better, like the Radeon 7 triple fan axial cooler. 
The 5700 XT is a hard regression in design. AMD needs to concede that it can't make what any reasonable person considers to be a, quote, actually pretty good and quiet blower cooler. It's not happening here, and this is certainly not, it's the same conclusion as we come to with all the other blower reference coolers, which is don't buy it. Just buy a partner model if you're going to buy the card. The partner models will be far, far better for thermal and acoustic performance. Finally, reaching the end of all of this data, there are a couple of things. First of all, gaming performance is, it's up and down. It's like a tennis match. In uh, some of the games we've tested, like some of the older DX11 titles, for example, surprisingly, Navi has done pretty well. So it's, it's actually genuinely fairly competitive in some of those titles after the price reduction is taken into account. So this is not 5D chess. This is they had to drop the price. And that's fine. It doesn't matter why they dropped the price. So all that matters is that it's lower now. And, uh, and it was before anyone ordered it, which, well, that's a dummy sample. It's, um, it's actually not functional, so don't worry about it. That'll be in our teardown later. I should have mentioned that earlier. Where this card doesn't do well is in thermals. And we've given this part of the review to NVIDIA in the past as well, when they used to do blower cards. And we still kind of ribbed them over there a lot for their, their new Founders Edition designs. But the review we always gave to blower cards was that they're not worth it. And there are instances where you could justify it. For example, if you wanted to buy the reference board and stick a water cooler on it, sure, the VRM's good enough. You should skip the blower design. It's just not good. So the card itself, if you want to buy it, that's fine. It's OK. It's competitive to good in some of the scenarios, like GTA 5, for example. I don't know if we put that one in here, but GTA 5. Um, it did pretty well in F1 2018. The frame times are fantastic in F1 2018. Frame times take a hit in DX12 with Hitman 2. Everything kind of does, but AMD a bit more than others. So it's a bit give and take. But the card itself, without the cooler, is, uh, is a, a reasonable purchase. Get it with a different cooler, though. That's the recommendation we make. So uh, where do we go from here? Well, drivers, those are an issue. Uh, the, we ran into a lot of the driver bugs we've seen in the past, and we'll put some on the screen here, where it does the multicolored thing when you first install. This isn't even just press drivers. A lot of these photos are from the public drivers, the new public drivers on an RX 590 and a Radeon 7. So it's not even unreleased stuff that this is happening on. It's been happening for years. Uh, this is on multiple different systems. We've had it happen over multiple different years now. And just in the last week, three different systems, three different monitors, three different motherboards, same thing happened, three different operating systems. And, or installs anyway, 1903 for all of them. So drivers are a problem. It's not a great user experience. You can work around that one by rebooting. But it'll happen every now and then if you leave the system idle and let the, the screen go to sleep. Other issues with the drivers include overclocking, being broken. So this is the biggest point uh, to, to bring it back to, is that currently with the drivers we have, overclocking does not function in a way that seems like it makes sense. Even with the updated version, with the updated thermal policy, which really just means the fan is faster, it's still not functioning well. You should basically set the power target to plus 50% and then stop touching the dials because the frequency at that point will auto jump to something that's probably kind of stable and any tuning beyond that, it was just we had all kinds of issues with the drivers. So we'll revisit that once they fix them up. And this is something AMD is aware of. It is something that AMD is working on. Very brief recap then. The Navi card, in comparison to the Ryzen launch, is a letdown. The R5 3600 was much more compelling, for example, as is the 3900X. The Navi card has significant issues with thermal, with noise. It, is, it required a node uh, process shrink to become competitive with NVIDIA, and the power consumption is still higher on average, but it's not significant anymore. So that is, we'll, we'll give credit there. It's not as bad. It's actually power is high er than NVIDIA, but it's not high. So it's not to a point where it's actually going to matter for basically anyone. So uh, performance-wise, the GPU is defensible as a purchase. It's fine. Don't buy this one. Buy one by a partner with a good cooler on it, and you'll be much happier. I think that pretty much sums up our review. It's fine with a different cooler. And uh, that'll cap it for us here. So thank you for watching. Subscribe for more as always. It's been a busy uh, day one of them. And you can go to store.cameras.net to support us directly by picking up a toolkit or a mod mat. 
and patreon.com slash gamers nexus and definitely check back on the channel for the teardown of this card because we do some cool stuff with it so i'll see you all next time